If you like what you hear on this episode, you're going to want to come check out my new podcast called the Unfuck Your Brain Podcast. What you're listening to right now, The Lawyer Stress Solution, has ceased production of new episodes. But Unfuck Your Brain is rocking and rolling. Every week, I release a new episode of the Unfuck Your Brain podcast, teaching you the same great tools for taming your brain, but with even more applications to other areas of your life. You can search for it by name. Remember, there's an asterisk instead of the U in Unfuck because we like to be polite. Or just click the link to it in the podcast description for this show. I'll see you over there. You're listening to The Lawyer Stress Solution, the only podcast that teaches you cognitive science-based techniques specifically created for lawyers. Learn how to manage your lawyer brain and conquer the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm of lawyer life. Here's your host, former lawyer and certified master coach, Kara Lowenthal. Hello, my lawyer friends. Happy Sunday. It's a Sunday when I'm recording this. And when I was a lawyer practicing full-time, and really before that, even in law school and in college and high school, Sundays were always kind of the worst, right? I would wake up on Sunday morning, and that part was nice. It was still the weekend. I had the whole day ahead of me. But usually what happened is that all the work I had procrastinated on the whole week before, I would have put on my to-do list for Sunday. So the minute I woke up Sunday, it was like, now it was the deadline and I had to do all of this work. And I would put it off all day, but then I wouldn't really enjoy the day because I was kind of constantly looking ahead to how I should be doing the work. And the anxiety and the guilt would start to build until eventually Sunday night, I would get all the work done, super stressed out. And I would start the week on Monday feeling really depleted from the day before and like the work week had already really begun 12 hours earlier. So today I want to talk to you about procrastination because I know that some of you are having the exact same Sunday experience that I used to have, right? Those Sunday blues. So not only was I a lawyer previously, but I grew up with lawyers. So I grew up thinking that procrastination was just kind of how things were. My mom was a lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer, and I always remember her doing her work late into the night or filing for extensions whenever she could. And I didn't really think anything of it. And of course, I don't blame her at all. She had three small children and was working full time. And that makes people busy. But I definitely got the idea early on that doing things at the last minute was just kind of how it goes, and especially for lawyers. So I completely adopted that. And starting in probably middle school, whenever I really had assignments. And then through high school, I was a total procrastinator. And if you had asked me, I would have said, I just was born like this. Like maybe it's genetic, (laughs) right? My mom does it. I do it. Everyone in my family procrastinates. In college, I became notorious for writing papers the night before they were due and not just like five-page papers, but more like 30-page papers. And my friends are still to this day, kind of horrified and talk about it. And then when I got to law school, it only got worse, right? Because once I got through that Socratic method first year, most of my classes weren't Socratic. And there was really only one thing I had to turn in, which was the paper or the exam at the end of the course. So I could really procrastinate, right? I could spend three months of a semester not really doing much on the paper or the exam prep and just pushing it off, barely getting my reading done, really, and then doing it all at the last minute. And I was kind of cursed in that I was able to do really well doing everything at the last minute. So there weren't really any external repercussions or consequences that I could see that were motivating enough to kind of change my behavior, even though it felt terrible, but I didn't think I had any control over it. And really, towards the end of law school, especially, I would do things like outline an entire class the night before the exam. So when I left law school and started my professional career, and I clerked for a judge, and then I litigated, and then I was an academic at a policy, did policy work, all through that entire process, I was constantly procrastinating. And it really wasn't until a few years ago when I discovered this coaching work that I now practice and 
applied it to myself that I really started to understand what was going on with my procrastination, why I was procrastinating, and how to solve it. And now I almost never procrastinate, honestly and truly, which I never thought that I would ever be able to say. I would have thought that would require some kind of like genetic code splicing, but it's really true. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. Why you procrastinate, which is not why you think, otherwise there wouldn't be much point to this podcast, right? Why you procrastinate and what you can do about it. So the first question is, what is procrastination? Now, we all sort of have an intuitive sense of what that means, and I just described my own personal history of procrastination. But basically, it means not doing something when you could be doing it, right? It means to put off the doing of something. That can really be anything, right? It can be writing a brief or it can be getting your tires rotated. But I'm really going to be focusing on legal work since I coach lawyers and most of you listening are probably lawyers. And procrastinating our work work, our professional work, is where we get the most stress from. So if you'd asked me before why I procrastinated, as I said, I would have said it was just like inherent. It was just me. I also probably would have said that I didn't like the work. So, you know, I had the idea that when I liked something, I would do it. But if I didn't like some kind of work, I wouldn't do it, right? Like I didn't like the subject matter or I didn't like the format or type of work, right? Like I didn't like reviewing contracts or I didn't like working on this particular legal issue. Or I would have said it was hard it was going to be challenging and I didn't know how to do it. Or I would have said that it was stressful, like that writing this brief was stressful and I would just sort of have taken that at face value. It's stressful. That's why I don't want to do it. That's why I put it off. So I was right in a sense. I was putting it off because it was stressful, but I didn't understand why it was stressful. And my bet is that most of you don't understand why you find your own work stressful and why you procrastinate. So that's what I really want to break down for you today. And to do that, we're going to do a tiny little bit of evolutionary biology, just like not even 101, like 001. <laughs> but basically, as you may have heard before this idea, we have different layers to our brains, right? So we have a primitive brain, which we share with most other animals, and that's the brain that produces things like the flight or fright response, right? Your most kind of basic reactions. Then there's other kind of levels of the brain. At the top is the prefrontal cortex, which is the most recent, evolutionarily speaking, and the part of your brain that does like long-term thinking and creative strategic ideas and can think about like long-term gratification and where your sort of sense of quote-unquote discipline comes from. Like all of that comes from your prefrontal cortex, from the executive function of your brain. And then the primitive part of your brain, I like to call your lizard brain. <laughs> so your lizard brain, your lizard brain evolved to protect you from danger. So what happens is when your brain perceives a threat, when your brain thinks that something is threatening, your lizard brain just starts to freak out, right? It produces a lot of stress in the body. And stress is really just a hormonal change in your body. So when the lizard brain sees a threat or danger, it triggers your brain to produce Hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which have various physical reactions that would make it easier to do something like outrun a lion, <laughs> right? So like your muscles tense, your blood flow increases, your heartbeat goes up, you become less sensitive to physical pain. All of these things mean that if actually something was trying to eat you, you could run away faster and you would not experience as much kind of distress in the moment as you were running away. You would have more endurance and you would feel less pain so you could get away more. Now, most of us, especially those of us listening to podcasts, are not usually being pursued by things that want to eat us. But your lizard brain doesn't know that because your lizard brain evolved over millions and millions of years, billions of years, and modern history is just a blip in the timeline. So your lizard brain is constantly seeing things that it thinks are lions trying to eat you. So whenever it sees anything as a threat, right? And in fact, given the fact that we now, most of us, thankfully, do not deal with a lot of sort of threats to our physical safety in our life these days, the lizard brain is kind of bored and always looking for something. So like, for instance, you may have heard the theory that our immune systems these days, for those of us in the developed world with sanitation and clean water and all of that, the idea that our immune systems are actually sort of understimulated. And so that's why we're seeing a rise in immuno-based disorders because our immune systems are understimulated. They don't have enough to fight, so they turn on themselves. That's kind of what I think the lizard brain does. 
The lizard brain doesn't have a lot of actual threats to save us from. There aren't a lot of things out there trying to eat and kill us all the time. And so the lizard brain doesn't know what to do with itself, but it has this highly evolved system for responding to threats. And so it doesn't just shut down. Instead, it just responds to much smaller threats all the time, even though they aren't actually really physically dangerous in the sense of you're about to be eaten and killed. So your lizard brain is just looking for things to be anxious and scared about. And when it sees something to be anxious and scared about, its instinct is to get the hell away from it, right? To avoid it. So this is why when we are anxious as humans, we tend to avoid the thing that makes us anxious. So when you think about this with your work, if you have something to work on and you are anxious about working on it, your brain is like, that's a lion, get away from it, (laughs) right? Your brain does not want to engage with the thing. Think about it, if something was coming towards you to eat you, you wouldn't like stop and reason about it. If your lizard brain was in charge, you would just run away. And that's what happens. So when we feel anxious about anything we need to complete, our lizard brain kicks in, we feel a stress response in our body, and then our instinct is to get away from the thing. So like ignore it, avoid it, do something else. So this is happening kind of low level in the background when you're not even aware of it. And that's why when you sit down and write a brief, you find yourself on Facebook 20 minutes later and you're like, wait, how did I get here? What am I doing? It's because you had a subconscious thought about the brief. You had a stress response that came up in response to that. Your lizard brain sent a stress response into your body. And then your lizard brain was like, okay, the way to get away from this stress response, I don't want to feel this anxiety. Something's dangerous is happening. The way to get away from it is for me to get away from it, do something else, not be looking at the work, not be thinking about it. Then I won't feel stressed out. So that's what you're doing. The instinct is to escape and avoid, and your brain thinks that the brief is something that's going to eat you. But the next really important question is, why does your brain think the brief is going to eat you? (laughs) Right? You can understand why the lizard brain thought that a lion was going to eat you, or, you know, if you're a lizard, something much smaller, right? That primitive brain evolved to detect physical predators, actual threats to your safety. The brief is not, does not look like a threat to your safety. And this is where your thoughts, your subconscious thoughts become really important. So think about it. When your eyes see something that's going to eat you, a lion, let's say, when your eyes see a lion, your eyes can't actually control your release of hormones and your stress response, right? Your eyes have to send that information through your brain which processes it and has a thought about it. And that thought directs the lizard brain to do something. So the same thing is happening. When you are avoiding your work because it produces anxiety or stresses you out, so you avoid it to get away from that feeling, it's not just the work itself. It's the thought that you have about the work. That's what causes the stress response, and that's what you're trying to avoid. Now, that could take a couple of different forms. It could be a thought about the work itself. So if your thought is, I hate reviewing contracts, then obviously you are not going to want to review contracts. It could be a thought about the consequences of finishing the work. So when I was litigating, I had a supervisor who was very exacting, let's say, and I was a new lawyer and very you know insecure about my abilities. And I used to really dread finishing projects because I knew that I was going to get back all this criticism and I hadn't sort of evolved in my coaching skills enough. I mean, I didn't have the coaching work at that time, but I just hadn't evolved enough in my own mental and emotional development to not be bothered by that, which is something many of you may also still feel bothered by that. And we're, I'm totally going to talk about that in an upcoming episode. But for right now, right, what I didn't want to experience was the consequence of doing the work. So I might not really have had any objection to doing the work. I was a, a reproductive rights litigator and I enjoyed that. But I had a lot of thoughts about what it was going to be like to get all that feedback and how I was going to feel about it. So that's what would make me avoid the work. And then the other thing that comes up for people, and this is sort of implicit in what I was just saying, but a lot of people have it very explicitly in my experience, is thoughts about your own abilities. So many of my clients have really perfectionistic type A tendencies, which is, again, something I'll talk about in another podcast episode. But that means that when they're looking at work, What's coming up is a lot of thoughts about their own ability to do the work and do it well and what it will mean if they don't do it well. So that's what's really causing that stress response for them is those thoughts, right? I'm not good at this. I'm not a good lawyer. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what the partner wants. I don't know how to make the client happy. I'm never going to succeed if I'm not good at this. 
And this all sounds so dramatic, but that's because we're not usually consciously thinking it. But it is happening on a subconscious level. So one of my brain's favorites was always, I don't know how. (laughs) Like that was my brain's favorite thought. I don't know how. Even though that was sort of manifestly untrue, I had become a lawyer. I passed the bar. You know, I always had figured out how to do things. When confronted with a new challenge, my brain just went, I don't know. I don't know how to do that, which is really common in perfectionist, high-achieving type A people because we're really taught, especially in law school, that it's basically super dangerous to not know the answer. It's never okay to not know the answer. You should always know the answer. That really backfires when you're trying to learn something new because your brain tells you you should already know how. So that was the catch-22 I was in. I'm sure some of you can relate. My brain would just constantly be like, I don't know. I don't know. So I used to imagine it kind of like a turtle on its back, like when you turn a turtle on its back and it can't, not that we would ever do that. We're nice to turtles, all of us, I'm sure. But if you've ever seen a turtle on its back, it can't right itself, right? That's what I imagine my brain doing. It's like the minute it saw a new challenge, like I had to come up with an argument that I hadn't fully fleshed out already, or I had to write a new document that I didn't know how to write, right? Like I ran a small think tank for a while and The first time I had to do a grant proposal, or when I was an academic, the first time I had to write an academic article, or even when I was litigating, when I had to come up with a new argument about something, my brain would just flip over on its back like a turtle and be like, I don't know how, so I guess we'll just not do it. So that was my thought always, I don't know how. And probably some of you have similar thoughts. So I'm absolutely going to teach you how to change those thoughts. But before I get to explaining how to change your brain's thinking about your work so that you stop procrastinating, I need to address one really important thing that isn't necessarily obvious from what I've been saying. So when I teach workshops, I ask everybody, how many people here procrastinate? And usually, you know, if there's 20 people in a workshop, at least 18 will raise their hands, like if not the whole 20, (laughs) usually it's the whole 20. And then the organizer also, right? Everybody. And then if I say, how many of you think you need to procrastinate or procrastination is useful to you? And everybody keep their hands down. Nobody thinks they like to procrastinate. Then if I say, how many of you think that you, quote unquote, work best under a deadline, most people's hands will shoot up, right? So most people don't see that these two things are intimately acquainted. Procrastination and I work best under a deadline, right? Most people think that they don't want to procrastinate, but then they also think that they work best under a deadline, So I'm going to explain to you how those things are related so that you really understand the dynamics that are happening in your brain and your procrastination, and then I'll teach you how to change it. So here's what's happening when you work procrastinate a lot, but work best under a deadline. Remember we said when you procrastinate, what's happening is that lizard brain sees your work as the threat because your brain's having a thought about the work that causes anxiety for you, and so it wants to avoid it. What happens when the deadline gets close enough is that the threat your brain senses switches from the work to the deadline. So if previously your brain thought that the work was the thing that was going to kill and eat you, now your brain thinks the deadline is the thing that's going to kill and eat you. And the way to get away from the deadline is to do the work, right? You follow me? So if your thought originally about the work was subconsciously, I don't want to do this because I don't think I'm good at it and the partner on this case always hates what I do and how am I ever going to succeed as a lawyer if I can't please him? If those are the thoughts you were having about your work, those would stress you out. You'd want to avoid it. That keeps going until you get close enough to the deadline that your more urgent thoughts become, if I don't finish this assignment by the deadline, then he's really going to be mad at me, he or she, the partner, or then I'm really not going to be able to advance my career, or then I'm going to be late and that's going to be so embarrassing, right? Whatever it is, you start to have a new thought about the deadline. The deadline becomes the scary thing. And then the way to get away from the deadline is to complete the work, right? At that point, your brain doesn't see avoidance as a solution to getting away from the anxiety because your executive function, the top part of your brain, right, knows that the deadline is coming. That's the part of your brain that can like tell time, right, and predict consequences. It knows the deadline is coming. And so at that point, avoidance stops seeming like a good strategy to avoid the stress and anxiety. At that point, the only way to resolve the stress and anxiety of the deadline is to do the work. So that's why you find yourself saying things like, I don't know why I waited until the last minute. This was stressing me out for a week. I had all that time to work on it. And I was stressed out about it then, but I didn't do it until the very last minute. If you didn't know why, that's why. 
your brain changes its perspective on what the danger is from the work itself to the deadline. So thinking that you work best under a deadline is really a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's also a way of describing this unconscious pattern. And the truth is, which segues into the next thing I want to talk to you about, once you understand how to change the thoughts that cause procrastination, then you don't need the deadline to forcibly change your thoughts for you and produce the work at the very last minute. So let's talk about how to change procrastination. And there are a couple of reasons it's worth changing. And these are these relate to kind of how you change it. So one is obviously it's stressful and unpleasant, right? None of us enjoy procrastination. It's not like you are blissfully enjoying the time before the last minute. Most of us are just kind of anxious and dreading it the whole time and then super stressed at the last minute, right? So it's not a really fun roller coaster ride. The second is that when you are stressed out, your creativity really decreases. So I see this with my clients all the time. And if you think about it with the lizard brain, if something is about to eat you and you need to run away, that is not a time for you to think creatively and strategically about like future ways to engage the thing that wants to eat you. And how could you have avoided getting yourself into the situation in the first place if you had gone 10 steps back in the decisions you made? Or could you negotiate with the thing that wants to eat you to reach a different outcome? (laughs) Like none of that, right? When something wants to eat you, you just need to get away from it. So what that means is that stress really puts blinders on your intellectual abilities. It kind of shuts down some of that executive function prefrontal cortex work and just focuses on getting you away from it. So creativity and strategic thinking is one thing you sacrifice when you are working under extreme stress conditions. What this also means is that your work is not as high quality as it could be right? That just makes sense. If you spent a whole week researching and writing and thinking and rewriting and revising, you know your brief's going to be stronger, whatever it is you're doing, is going to be stronger than if you do it all at the last minute, right? And side note, this is one of the ways that we really create what we fear. And I'm going to talk about that a lot more in a future episode. But just to give you a little sneak peek, right? When your fear is, for instance, the partner on this case is going to send me all this critical feedback about the brief, he hates my work, and you delay doing it until the last minute, and then you do it under extreme stress, and you don't have time to reflect on it, and you don't have time to revise on it, what are the odds? Is it more or less likely that someone's going to have a lot of critical feedback on it? It's more likely, right? Because you haven't had time to proofread or read it over or think about it or revise or show it to someone else, or you haven't had as much time as you could have to work on it and make it the best possible product you can. So there's a way in which our fears that keep us procrastinating actually make themselves come true, which is another good reason to stop procrastinating. Okay, so we know what procrastination is, right, and what causes it. It's our lizard brain response to the thoughts we have about our work that freak us out and we want to avoid it until the very last minute when the deadline hits and then we want to avoid the deadline. We know what's bad about it. It's stressful and it produces a lower quality work product. So what do we do about it? Well, if the solution has to be based on the cause, right? If the cause of your stress is your thoughts, then the solution is also going to be your thoughts. So here's what you have to do. The first thing is you have to figure out what you are thinking that is causing the procrastination, right? So for me, like I said, my thought, usually my go-to thought for my brain is I don't know how. When I think that, I feel a low-level anxiety that I then block out by doing other things, right? I just feel this like avoidance and resistance to doing the task. Yours may be something totally different, right? Yours may be any of the examples we talked about, right? Might be, I don't know. That's a big one. I'm afraid I won't do a good job. I'm not a great lawyer. I don't think the partner on this case is going to like my work. I don't know what the client wants. I've never done this before. What if I make a mistake? What if something goes wrong, right? I'm not completely sure about this answer, Any of those could be the thoughts or it could be something totally different. So this part is really a process of inquiry that you have to do with yourself, right? And you have to get beyond the sort of obvious solution your brain will give you. Because when you ask your brain, why don't you want to do this? Your brain will just probably say like, well, it's hard or I don't like it, (laughs) right? It's like toddler level. You can't accept that at face value. Sometimes that is the only thought you're having is it's hard and I don't like it. And then you can come up with something else, like it's not that hard and maybe I'd like it if I tried, right? Or whatever you might want to think instead. 
So sometimes it is that superficial first level thought. But for a lot of us, we're not used to noticing what we think. And the way to notice what you're really thinking is just to ask yourself some questions, right? It's nothing complicated and lawyers are great at asking questions. You can even write it down. Sometimes it's easier to write it down and write down the question than write down the answer. Why am I avoiding this work? What am I afraid of? Right? That's a great question to ask yourself when you're procrastinating. What am I afraid of? What am I trying to avoid? And then the answer will come up and you'll see whether you're thinking something about yourself or something about the work or something about, you know, the client or the partner on the case or whatever it is. And I should say the way to really know if it's the thought is when you think it, do you feel anxious? That's generally what you're trying to avoid with procrastination. For some people, it's a little heavier feeling like depression or dread. But for a lot of people, it's a kind of agitated feeling of anxiety. So that's how you can check. When you ask yourself, what am I afraid of? What am I trying to avoid? And your brain gives you an answer, like a thought comes up, a sentence comes up, then just read that sentence or think that thought to yourself and see how you feel. And it should match, right? It should be what you were feeling that you were asking yourself about. So then what you have to do is you have to come up with a new thought that you're going to think on purpose when you find yourself thinking that old thought. So for instance, for me, when my brain goes into turtle mode and it flips over on its back and goes, I don't know how, <laughs> we just have to give up. Let's just close up shop. I don't know how, right? Then what I like to practice thinking is I've always figured out things when I didn't know how to do them before. Or I'll think to myself, all I have to do is start trying and then I'll figure it out. Those are the thoughts that I used a lot in the beginning. And one thing you will notice, like for me, now that I've been doing this work for a while, now I don't even have to do that part. Like now I mostly don't procrastinate at all. On the rare occasion I do procrastinate, I just check in with myself. I notice I'm having that turtle thought of I don't know. And then I just am like, oh, right, there we go. I'm having that old thought again. Now I know that thought is dumb and not true. Let me just do this. So that's where you get eventually. But at the beginning, you really need to have a thought you're going to practice on purpose. So here's how you come up with a thought to practice on purpose. You take whatever the current thought is that you figured out by asking yourself, and then you brainstorm what are some things you could think instead that would feel better. Now, sometimes you can go to a really positive thought right away, like I'm a great lawyer. I totally know how to do this. My work is going to be awesome. Sometimes that works. If you say that to yourself and you don't really believe it and it doesn't feel any better, then that's not a good thought for you. That's too far. So then you need to try to find something neutral, like I'll probably be able to figure this out. Or I know in the past I've been insecure about my work, but then I've gotten positive feedback. Or the client always seems cranky when they first get the work, but in the end they're pleased. Or I know that if I try hard, I can produce something good. Right, Whatever it is, you need to brainstorm. Everybody's thoughts are a little bit different and different words have different connotations for different people. So no one can sort of figure this out for you. But the good news is you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly which thoughts are helping. And the way to do that is you just you think the thought to yourself on purpose. You can even say it out loud and you just see how you feel. If you feel any better than you did before, then that's a good thought for you to use. Right? We're not trying to go to 100% self-confidence overnight or 100% chill overnight. That's not realistic most of the time. We're just trying to feel a little bit better, alleviate some of that anxiety so that you can actually do the work. So if it's about the outcome, you can focus on past positive outcomes. Or to go back to something I said earlier, you can think about how if the outcome you fear is negative feedback, that avoidance is actually going to make that more likely, right? So you can think to yourself something like, if I actually start the work now, I'm going to have a much better product and I'll probably get less negative feedback, right? If it's about you, you can focus on a thought about your own abilities or past accomplishments that makes you feel a little bit better and more confident. If it's about the work itself, like I hate contracts, you can just start to be curious with yourself. Like, do you have to think and believe that? Could you think something like, even like, well, they're not my favorite part of the job, but they're never that bad once I start right? Even that feels better than I hate contracts. And even that will help you do the work a little more quickly than just thinking I hate contracts and avoiding it. So that's how procrastination works. And that's the solution. Procrastination is caused by your thoughts and the fear and anxiety response in your body that is created by thinking that the work is a danger or a threat to you. And then procrastination is solved by changing the thoughts you have about the work, right? We can't change the work all we can change is the thoughts you have about the work 
And if you change those thoughts, you will produce a much less or even no stress response in your body. And without that stress response, that anxiety, you won't need to avoid the work. So that's how procrastination works. Because my podcast is new, I'm asking all of you to write a review on iTunes for me. And if you do write the review, you'll be entered into a weekly raffle for a free half hour coaching session where we'll get super specific about what's going on in your job and how you're getting stressed out and what thoughts are causing it and what you could practice thinking instead to really alleviate your stress and anxiety. So if you want to enter, you just go to www.thelawyerstresssolution.com. It's the name of the podcast, thelawyerstresssolution.com backslash iTunes. And that page will take you through the whole process of doing a review in iTunes, which is super easy. And then it's just going to ask you for a tiny bit of information so we can identify which review you wrote. And you'll be entered into a weekly raffle and you'll have a chance to do a little work like this with me for free. And there's nothing more fun than that. So point your browser there. I hope to talk to some of you soon. And in the meantime, go forth and lawyer. If this episode resonated with you, you need to come check out The Clutch. Because once you've learned how to coach yourself, we have a whole bonus course called How to Get Really Fucking Organized. It's exactly what it sounds like. There's a video module and a workbook that walks you through the exact system and process that I used and I still use to build and manage a multi-million dollar business from scratch, see family, see friends, have time to date and for hobbies, get to the gym and still have time to relax and enjoy my life. If you've ever dealt with overwhelm or stress or overflowing inboxes or endless to-do lists, in other words, if you've ever been a human living in modern times, this course will change your life. And you'll get tons of support from the Clutch community and expert guidance whenever you need it to help you apply and keep applying these principles so that you can implement the system and truly transform your work life and every other part of your life too. You can learn how to accomplish more than you ever have before without the stress. It truly is possible. Just go to unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash the clutch, or you can just text your email address to 347 347- 934-8861. And we will text you right back a link to a mobile site where you can read all about the clutch and decide there if you want to join. I hope you will, because I know it will change your life. See you in there.